Hello to all physics enthusiasts and fans of physical experiments. I'm Alexei Kolchin, and today we will talk about the properties of granular materials. In school, we usually talk about the three main states of matter, solid, liquid, and gas. But then they add a fourth state, plasma. But if we talk not about substances, but about materials, the picture becomes significantly more complicated. Well, let's take sand, for example. Sand can flow like a liquid. But on the other hand, we can't pile up water while it's easy to do that with sand. So in this sense, granular materials have their own unique mechanical properties. And that's what we're going to talk about now. And we'll start with this experiment. Here in this jar, I have four kilograms of sand. And I'm going to pour this sand into a tube. Underneath it, there are scales. And on top, there's a lid. To prevent the sand from spilling out to the sides, let's see what it shows us. The scales in this experiment moved. And the scales showed less than one and a half kilograms. 140 kilograms. Where did the other kilograms go? Let's try to explain this paradoxical result of our experiment. When we pour the first portion of sand, its entire weight rests on the bottom of the cylinder. But let's see what happens when the cylinder is filled to a sufficiently high level. Let's isolate a grain of sand. Its weight is distributed among the grains of sand lying beneath it, and the forces that arise are directed not vertically, but at an angle. At the next step, the redistributed forces can tilt even more, and as a result, the grains of sand near the walls get pressed against those walls. And since these grains of sand are pushed down, there is a frictional force acting on them, directed upwards. So the upper layers of sand are supported by this frictional force and create almost no additional pressure on the bottom of the container. Scientists who study granular materials have come up with a way to observe the distribution of contact forces using the photoelastic effect. In these experiments, the particles of the granular material were modeled with plastic disks and illuminated through crossed polarizers. The dark particles here are practically unloaded, while the light particles form contact chains along which the force is transmitted. And in this picture, you can clearly see how the weight of the granular material pushes against the side walls through the force chains. While we were busy explaining, the sand managed to settle a bit. It settles down, and the scale now reads 600 grams. We don't have any more sand. And here is a weight filled with lead, and it weighs just over two kilograms. I'm lowering it into the tube. And the scale readings increased by just 100 grams. And here I am, stepping in for Alexei with a little critical speech. Of course, it's great everything he demonstrated to us and explained like weight. The sand is redistributed onto the walls of the container through force bridges, but the size of the grain of sand is so small several hundred times smaller than the diameter of the cylinder in our experiment. So how can we calculate this redistribution of weight using bridges? It seems we need to introduce another one. In the model where the grains of sand are treated as separate entities, there won't be anything at all mentioned about them. Instead, macroscopic indicators will be considered, such as the force of friction and some other things that I will talk about now. And for this purpose, I will build a mathematical model like this, somewhat simplified, but very effective. We are looking at a pipe and isolating a layer of sand within it. And let's take a look at all the forces acting on this layer, since it is stationary. The sum of these forces is equal to zero. So, what force is acting on us, first of all? The force of gravity is acting downwards. So, we need to take Rg and multiply it by the volume of this layer the area PR2, and by the height, the dx. So what supports this layer? Well, first of all, the pressure difference, the pressure from above and the pressure from below, which is greater. And so I will denote the difference in these pressures as dp. Well, again, this dp is applied uh, to the area PR2. And if 
we were to limit ourselves to these terms, we would have pure hydrostatics. We reason like this for water and for sand. We have another term that relates to the friction against the wall. Well, so I need to write the friction coefficient m multiplied by the force that... So it presses this sand against the walls, but what causes it to be pressed? But uh, Alexei was talking about bridges, and I'll put it simply. We compress the sand in the vertical direction, and it expands in the horizontal direction. So we introduce such a coefficient of expansion. So mm, let's assume that if the force P compresses, then the pressure K P presses this sand against the walls. So that means a multiplied by K P. And by the area of the lateral surface of this cylinder, 2P, R multiplied by dx. And if we divide everything here by P, R squared dx, we will get this differential equation D as a result. P, it's over dx. First of all, the yeast is pure hydrostatics, and now comes the minus. 2 men K divided by R, and so multiplied by the pressure P itself. The second term has a negative sign. Well, the higher the pressure, the more we subtract from R here. And the slower the pressure increases with depth. And to write down the solution to this equation, it will be convenient for us to divide the quantity R by 2mk and denote it with a single letter L. This is some length since m and k, dimensionless coefficients. So the, the solution looks like this. With depth, the pressure increases P from x as RGL multiplied by this bracket 1 minus the exponent, where the exponent has minus x divided by L. Well, I drew it here. This solution is on the graph. At first, the pressure increases linearly as in hydrostatics, and then it approaches an asymptotic value. P, it equals RGL, and beyond this pressure, the sand can no longer exert any force on the bottom of this pipe. And so, Andre explained the theory, beautiful in its simplicity, so now we can test it in an experiment. And for this, we assembled this setup in which we took a smaller diameter pipe, replaced the scales with a force sensor, and we'll be pouring the sand in small portions of 10 cubic centimeters. And here are the results of our experiment. And we see a graph that looks very much like an inverted exponent. And it's clear that the maximum load on the bottom is approximately Newton's. Let's thank Alexei for the results. It's clear that the theory works perfectly. Well, next we can make some calculations. So, the critical uh, force with which the sand presses down in this experiment. And so, accordingly, we find the critical pressure at the bottom by dividing the force by the area of the bottom, which is 360 pascals. On the other hand, from the theory, so through this critical pressure, we express the characteristic height L, which is the part of the sand that is still pressing down on the bottom, while the part above is pushing against the walls. Well, we find this length by dividing P star by the density in G, and we get centimeters. By the way, it turned out to be exactly the radius of the tube in our experiment. Well, now we can move on to their characteristic dimensionless parameters were two more. The coefficient of friction of the sand against the wall and the coefficient of lateral pressure. What pressure do we get and what fraction does it represent of the pressure when we compress and with what pressure does it expand? Well, the coefficient k is expressed in this way. You need to divide the radius of the pipe by this L. Well, this is what we have. And we know that this is the same in our experiment, and then divide by 2 mu. So, if we know the coefficient of friction of the sand against the wall, then we'll also know the coefficient of lateral pressure of the sand. We'll learn everything about sand. And it's worth noting that in our experiment, the coefficient of friction was quite high. The tube was specially prepared for us. First, it was coated with paint, and then sand was sprinkled on it. 
So basically we're dealing with the friction coefficient of sand against sand. So how do we measure it? To do this we'll take another tube like this one which was wrapped in double-sided tape and also sprinkled with sand. I'm putting it in the tube. And I start to gradually increase the angle of inclination and at a certain angle of inclination this little tube falls down, but from this triangle we can find the tangent of the angle of inclination, and it turns out to be equal to... And this is the coefficient of friction of sand against sand. Well, from the formula that Andre has already written. Now we can find the coefficient of lateral pressure by substituting the value of the friction coefficient, and we get the coefficient of lateral pressure, year point sac, and, by the way, we found an article on the internet by researchers from the Novosibirsk Institute of Mining, Klishin and Mikanina, in which numerical modeling resulted in a practically identical value. I would like to emphasize our main result once again. If we pour sand into a long tube, almost all of its weight rests on the walls of the tube, while only a small part of that sand's weight is on the bottom. If the walls of such a tube are thin enough, the weight on them can lead to a loss of stability. And the tube, it will unexpectedly collapse. And now, here's another amazing experiment that has been prepared for this. This metal tube has one end sealed with a piece of foam. I'm inserting a funnel into the tube. Now I'm inserting the steel pin. And I start pouring in the sand. Here, there's more than 300 grams of it. Here it is. It's completely gone into the tube and now I'm lifting the tube. Holding only onto the pin. And the tube is supported by the pin. I can even apply some effort, but only with a lot of force can I manage to pull out the pin. How can this be explained? Share your thoughts on this in the comments to our video on AutoYouTube.